Listen. So Lock and Key is a comic series that at one point was set to be a movie trilogy. There was even a filmmaker named Steven Spielberg who had his eyes on it. Fox had actually shot a pilot starring Jesse McCartney before saying it was too scary and then canceling it. And then in the end, like many things, it just ended up on Netflix with producers who are no strangers to shows with famous locks. It's based on the comic created by Gabriel Rodriguez and Joe Hill, son of Stephen King, who both actually cameo in their own comic and then pop up in the live action one. And I would highly recommend reading the series because one, it's all free on Hoopla. And two, it's so much better. Like, there are great Netflix comic adaptations that know how to pick up on the tone. And then there are others that are fun. They get the gist of the story, but are too keen on keeping it family-friendly to the point that you realize it's not trying to be a masterpiece like the source material, but just something to pass the time. Is there anything that you feel that fans will have a strong reaction to? One of those topics that will be talked about for years after the fact? (laughs) I mean, I don't know that anything in season two rises to the fact that people will talk about it for years afterwards, but... Uh, we'll entertain you. So before we set up all the key points leading up to season two, a big shout out to our sponsor, PIA VPN, for supporting the channel and setting up a great discount to get the most out of your streaming right now. We're at the time where it's film festival season and every listener knows how much virtual festivals, they just pretty much change the game. And with the help of PIA VPN, you can catch all the best films and international selections that are playing all before the year is up, making you more cultured than the Academy. If any YouTube videos are ever geo-blocked, you can bypass those restrictions with this handy tool. You can keep your entire movie library intact where Ever you travel, you can get the most out of your Netflix catalog and all of your other subscriptions. Unlike others, they don't store any logs or mess with your data. They provide a seamless ad blocker to go with it, allow up to 10 devices. They got that 24-7 support and boast over 30 million downloads with that 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to stream more and stream better, head over to our link down below to get 83% off, 4 extra months free, and unlock your streaming potential. Now, full spoilers. Let me explain. So the series revolves around the Locke family who moved from Seattle to their ancestral home called Key House way out in the woods in Massachusetts. And while the family of four is just looking to get away, they end up discovering more keys in Kingdom Hearts that have all these magical abilities and it all calls back to their family lineage. Their ancestors would have been blacksmiths who fought in the Revolutionary War. Key House, in fact, was used as an intelligence base in World War II and little do they know that they'll be holding the keys to the next big demonic war. So let's go down the list. There's the head key which unlocks or can even add memory and it lets you see inside the, the mind of a person as the room takes the form of their desires. So it can look like Bodie Busters right here or even a room full of VHS memories. It's like someone used the head key on me, but now it's all real. The Anywhere key is probably one of the most used keys as it can help you transport through any doorway to wherever you desire. And so we've seen it used for some of the most daring escapades such as dining and dashing and stealing all 31 flavors of ice cream. Before you get mad, let me explain. The ghost key allows you to separate yourself from your body when you walk through a doorway, leaving behind your physical state as you fly around like Casper and it's interesting to note that with it you can talk to others who have died but only if they passed on the grounds. There's the matchstick key that simply just sets you on fire. The plant key that gives you more control of a greenhouse than poison ivy but it also serves as a way for plants to store memories. There's the music box key that is used to manipulate people so you pretty much just insert it and you can get your brother to slap himself or you know be the better person and bully your bully. The identity key allows you to change your appearance into that of another person's. The mending key fixes anything you need when you put it into this wardrobe. The echo key is able to bring someone back, but really only in the form of a memory come to life, whereas the shadow key summons monsters that help duplicate the person using it in order to accomplish whatever Netflix villain scheme they may have. And then there's the Omega key, which controls the black door and keeps it locked from the other dimension, which is really the gateway that's created everything. From it, a substance known as Whispering Iron shoots through, either finding a host that it can latch onto and possess, or, you know, weather into a little metal that can be molded into a new key that calls out in little whispers in order to be found. All that said though, all these tricks are for kids. That's how this stuff always works. Only kids can get into Narnia. (laughs) That's why the mom Nina is pretty oblivious to the entire season and what's going on. Mind you, she did also lose and witness the death of her husband, Rendell. So she's still absorbed in that trauma of getting shot in the leg and, you know, being sober for six years that she doesn't have the time to see two Bodies walking around. I need a project and my kids need a home. Bodie is the baby of the family who's described as being a Pop-Tart in human form, and Jackson Robert Scott continues to be the it kid for these horror films as he keeps looking down sewers that he really shouldn't be. And while it is Bodie who does kick off everything, you know, he's the one finding the first couple of keys, it is also Bodie who gets duped by Echo, the season's villain, into escaping. So while I get that he's cute, damn did this boy deserve the timeout key. Kids dealing with bear traps, trying to stick keys in people's necks without consent. And you know what, pardon the content warning, but... He's even stealing cookies from the cookie jar. These aren't toys. They're weapons. Can't they be both? 
And to think these siblings divided the keys and gave this child too? Tyler Locke is the eldest of the bunch who feels the guilt of not having saved his dad when he was right there, and to a degree even feels responsible since he knows the kid who attacked him and was venting to him. He's also struggling to get on the hockey team while suffering to get a prom date, and that's where he's dealing with two girls. There's Eden, the stuck-up actress who's always putting everyone down, and you know, you know it's bad when you get possessed by a demon and no one even notices. I hate to break it to you, but... Wanting to be a director doesn't mean that you are one. Jackie, on the other hand, is someone who always is looking out for Tyler, is always trying to set him straight, giving him second chances. Honestly, to the point that she may have been better off without him. You know, you can either be an asshole or a good guy, Tyler. Uh, it can't be both. There's also his jock friends, Logan and Javi, who are on complete opposite sides of the douche spectrum, but both are always helping him out whenever he needs it. Kinsey Locke is the middle child who's having a hard time fitting into this Hogwarts-like school, and an even harder time trying to pick between these two boys. First off, there's the one and only Scott with the one and only T, who is easily my favorite from the jump. He always steps up when he's needed and is actually the first to reach out to her in the school as he invites her into his film club, named after the great Tom Savini, who makes a cameo. And Scott's really the first person to learn about the Lockheed secret, even being able to use them for the special effects on the movie that he's working on known as The Splattering, which Netflix even made a trailer for. Hadouken. Then on the other side, there's Gabe, the film bro playing the lobster who, well, is the film bro playing the lobster. I know I should choose, but I don't want to. What if I dated you both? Ma'am, ain't no key gonna unlock that. Now, to me, the most interesting part of the show is the relationship between the siblings and how the keys, you know, while sometimes they are cop-outs, how it helps them cope, from each sibling recalling a different ending to their dad's bed night story, to Kinsey at one point literally killing one of her emotions by going into her head and burying her own fear. Final girls don't hide. They just don't. There's also then a bunch of other characters such as Duncan, their uncle whose memories are frozen in time, Ellie who's one of their dad's old friends who was a part of an incident that they've been hiding all of these years, and she also has her son Rufus who's the groundskeeper of Key House and in my opinion is one of the best characters who always pulls through when you need him, just like the dean named Joe who's been at the school since the parents were students and you know in my opinion was gone way too soon because he really gave the best advice and support. It's okay to lose yourself in this, just as long as you can find yourself again. Dodge is the big baddie and the entity that's been tormenting the locks and swapping through all these bodies in order to get in the way. Like Narnia, she's lying, she's a witch, and she'd be popping out of people's wardrobes. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Oh, and she's a creeper. Damn it, Netflix. To Bodhi, she's the well lady on the streets. She's known as Echo. And in the end, she really just goes by Dodge when she starts trying to seduce Tyler. And she's just in full control of the identity key that helps them disguise themselves as different people, including Lucas, a distant cousin of Ellie, who's really in the body of her high school boyfriend, who's been dead since that incident from long ago. It's hard to explain. Dodge's plan is to torment another one of Mr. Locke's teenage friends, Aaron, who was actually his high school ex back in the day. He just like never visited her, but she's been there since the incident that they had when they were teenagers. And Dodge decides to go visit her with the idea of getting into her head and snatching the location of the Omega Key. That's why Dodge ends up helping Sam, the student who was tormenting the Locks, to escape prison and make it to Key House. See, back when they were still in Seattle, Sam was abused by his father, leading him to act out and ending up in the counselor's office, which Mr. Locke was running. And while Sam would feel betrayed by the way that they diagnosed, him, he also became infatuated by Mr. Locke's key house portrait in his office, mainly because Dodge was the inner demon in his ear whispering and driving him to attack the Locke family, causing them to move away. And it isn't until the second face-off that they have the tools to unlock his inner thoughts with the head key, and they finally confront their tormentor, Tyler is able to let go of his guilt, and Sam releases his demons before the demons unlock him with a knife and release him. There's a reason why no one loved you, Sam. But like I said, Bodie just leaves keys left and right, and so Sam walks right through the ghost key door, and now he's just floating on in the grounds. Kinsey's fear comes back to attack Eden, as the siblings decide to tell the entire cast and crew town about their magical family secret, and in the most convenient narrative play, Ellie straight up head keys herself in order to give the kids the LME on what happened all those years ago. Honestly, it's kind of genius. See, what had happened was that back in the day, these kids were having a jolly good time using all of the keys, until they decided to open up the black door that caused the demon to attach itself to Lucas, who was part of the group. He used to do fencing, which is why he got the nickname of Dodge, but he ends up going berserk and smacks Aaron, putting her into the state that she's in, hammered one of the other friends, and then calls Rendell, the dad, to take him out. They then erased Duncan's memories since he was just a little kid and came up with this accident story about how everybody just drowned by the caves, and then they divided the keys between each other, with Ellie ending up with the Anywhere key and the Echo key, which brings back people from the dead, hence her present self wanting to bring back Lucas. What's crazy is that when you think about it, she did all of this a year prior to the 
events of the show, meaning that she was the one who unleashed the demon, which would lead to Sam getting possessed, causing the incident that would move the locks to Key House, and cause all of these twists and turns that leads to them putting hands on Rufus. <laughs> Unacceptable. Now listen, a lot of the show borders on being CW corny, and I give it the benefit of the doubt for, you know, taking a pretty mature comic, and yeah, they clear for a family-friendly audience, but... Oh my, when Lucas slash Dodge slash he or she or whatever ends an episode by putting on a crown to Billie Eilish's You Should See Me in a Crown and then utters the words, Hello Darkness, my old friend. I damn near used the match to key on myself. Dodge attacks with all of its shadows as the family has to play by Darkness Falls rules and not be caught without light, but they eventually knock her out, drag her body to the cave, and scoot her through the black door only to... <laughs> have a twist that is, ain't really a twist because when you rewatch it back there's really no clues there like it's not meant for you to be guessing it it turns out that gabe has been the evil person the entire time and is in fact one of the identities for echo slash dodge slash lucas slash whatever else who had this master plan of hoping that Bodie would have the guts to kill the shadow demon have it conveniently fall in the spot she needed it to and then seamlessly transport a decoy body that is actually Ellie, so the kids will end up being duped and toss her over to the other side. Now, why would the most well-versed character in this world known as Ellie not warn them with her final words? Maybe give them a clue? I, I don't know, call out to her son? It's hard to explain. In the end, it's able to set up more villains, a reason for the locks to stay, and a nice little cliffhanger that accomplishes the mission of getting a season two. So season 2 really focuses on Gabe and all of his shenanigans as he tries to collect and even make more keys and he does ad reads. That kinda sucks, I brought her favorite, Dr. Pepper and a bunch of Twizzlers. Hey! New wheels? Yes, brought to you by Netflix. In the process, he dupes, obviously Bodhi, into giving him the ghost key several times, only for he himself to get duped by a lock ancestor who tells him that he's not able to make keys himself, only to then almost get duped by Sam who tries to snatch his body, only for little Sam to still be a ghost out there. Eden has become his partner after getting hit with the whispering iron, causing a demon to take over her body, but she also becomes like this season's spirit animal, binging on more snacks than we do episodes, but besides seeing Eden and Eden, they actually do flesh her out more than season 1, even getting some bonding time with her mom. As for the lock, mom last time we saw nina she was seeing that conference season one and i guess just left him in the past so she's moved on to this history teacher named josh his daughter has also befriended bodhi and it's clear that he has a connection to the locks that dates way back probably a couple centuries meanwhile in his pursuit gabe snatches this history teacher's whispering iron so instead josh he has to get some whispering eye josh <clears throat> um what is this i can explain explain why you have a model of my house Bodhi, of course, is the one who unlocks this model with new key that's lying around, causing them to be able to see everything that's happening on the real grounds in real time, kind of like the head key does in the comics, and thus, they've solved world hunger, like any shortage in the world has now been fixed thanks to these magical Bodhi just uses it for gummy bears. And it's delicious! Aaron, after 25 years, finally gets some speaking time, and after unlocking her out of her mind using the head key, she heads in with the locks and rooms with them as she waits for her trust fund to kick in, because, you know... You know, when you're waiting for that, you, you just slum it in a mansion. I keep forgetting how rich these characters are. In her quest for the plan key, the kids end up pulling up a bag of memories that leads to Uncle Duncan finally remembering a lot of the stuff that he had forgotten, which I feel like the writers kind of need, because they would also bring up and then just forget that this man had a whole fiancé. Wow. You're old now. Duncan and Tyler both realize that they're able to make new keys themselves, and in my opinion, that just like adds more pressure for someone like Tyler, because for one, he's already dealing with Jackie's memory loss, going on more than 51 dates to help her remember, and, and even with the help of these new keys, she just refuses to catch up on season one, which like, Jackie wasn't that bad, but it's through Tyler that we see these two new keys, there's the Hercules key that gives you macho man strength, and this boy just keeps it on him at all times, and he also finds the memory key, which is the key to help your memory, thanks to his buddy Logan's master key, to the school. As for Kinsey and her squad, their theater premiere of the splattering was killer to say the least. That said, the sequel is in limbo since Scott may be leaving to the college of his dreams, causing Zadie to really step up, and Doug to just continue with his one-liners. Try and take this from me. Demons can't take keys from locks. I can't. JK. Going. I'm not gonna lie, I actually 
thought he was pretty funny to have around. Like, yeah, the man looks like he's paid mortgages that are older than these kids, but you know what? He's I. What isn't is Kinsey trying to be scot free like Ridley? Gabe and Eden the entire season are just trying to manipulate him into doing bad things via the music box, you know, the thing that she went overboard with in season one, and she just doesn't give Scott the benefit of the doubt that he's being controlled. Like, this man never spoiled your magical secrets in season one. You ruined his entire filming gear by forcing them into a cave. This is a man who powers a blender by pedaling, and you're just gonna leave him off to the side? She ends up using the head key on Eden at a party and is able to learn the truth about her own switcheroo, but also that my boy Scott was right. See, while all the characters in this season are going through like a sophomore slump, at, at least they had the set pieces and, and sequences that are amped up a bit more. There's the creepy mannequin challenge in Eden's mind that goes on. They try to emulate the shining maze. Jamie at one point traps Eden during a master plan, which I thought was kind of cool using the model. And they even have this 1775 flashback episode with these red coats who are trying to take advantage of this door and its demon powers. But then you actually get to see the original locks who created the first set of keys and did everything in their power to protect this doorway. And now, centuries later, the little young lock ancestors are battling on a cliffside house, causing more casualties than Sokovia. And look, the only reason it got this bad to begin with was because this crew had an eight-key lead and somehow botched a third act plan again. See, Dodge forces Duncan to forge a key that can actually turn people into demons. So now, all the townspeople from the cop to Javi are just going bad. And that's probably the most surprising part of the season, that you have so many deaths, it almost overshadows all of the new keys. At one point, Aaron pulls up with this chain key which seems to represent how she's finally free you know she's broken the bonds of her past and is able to take control of her gabe just chokes her out like <laughs> literally with the chains kinsey finds this wing key referencing back to a nice little easter egg that they had in season one as she literally sprouts wings and soars killing any attempt at that edgy style they kept trying to force on this character and even jackie gets put through the ringer as she already opted out to not wanting to deal with any of these keys only to get turned into a demon by a key and then when tyler reverse engineers that key to undemon her boy doesn't realize that the making of that one costs a life like i swear this show loves to pull up with last minute explanations what happened i think it's because i made the demon key turn around in the end, Echo, Gabe, Dodge, Charger is dead. Eden thinks that she can get the one up by bringing back Sergeant Kimi from the Lost Dimension and well, that doesn't turn out great for her. Ellie is back and the identity key her expeditiously before it becomes problematic, while Lucas is also back since he was, I guess, just in the sunken place for the last two seasons. Kinsey decides to co-star with her co-star finally. Bodhi uses the memory key so Mama Nina can finally remember what happened previously on the episodes, while Tyler chooses to just forget everything so that he could focus on his future. It, like, I get the sentiment, but wouldn't you just go back to the guilt you felt pre-season one? Like, isn't this whole journey what helped build to your future? Ain't you coming back for season three? Overall, it'll be interesting to see how crazy they go with the future villains, what other family secrets and cool keys will be revealed, if the splattering will ever get its sequel, but the most important thing of all is that Rufus is finally happy again. Thank you all for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. I'm curious to know, you know, what theories or Easter eggs you may have caught. If you haven't read the books, again, definitely go check them out on Hoopla. I think they're definitely worth reading. Uh, and the show, you know, it's decent for what it is. Obviously, it's going to deviate from the comics and hopefully it doesn't, you know, become more Stranger Things-ish. I feel like that's just become the, the main goal that a lot of these shows for Netflix are trying to be. Kind of right in the middle of that family-friendly side uh, that just downplays the comics a bit. But I would highly recommend go check out the series. I believe it's already completed. But other than that, I'm curious to see what you guys think what's going to happen in season three or four or however long they take this any spinoffs because you know they just love to expand like crazy but until next time let me know any of your theories thoughts all that down below in the comment section and until next time don't forget to comment like and subscribe and i'll send you the listen key